I'm holding in my hand here the first crankbait ever invented. Stick around as I crack open my UMCO 3500 and take a dive into crankbait history on this episode of Retro Basin. Retro bassin, kicking some ass in wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about bill dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40 year old lures. The year was 1915, when three anglers and founders of the Creek Chub Bait Company, Henry Dills, George Scuthless, and Carl Heiserling, set out to design a bait that would run just beneath the surface. This is that bait, the Creek Chub Wiggler. And as far as we can tell, this is the first crankbait ever invented. The Creek Chub Wiggler was patented in 1920. It featured a wooden body, a metal lip, dual treble hooks, and two different line ties so the angler could vary the retrieve. This is a solid chunk of wood, no doubt. Check out that paint job, those glass eyes, and Look at that bill. That thing looks like that would be mean in some shallow water. I mean, by today's standards, it doesn't look like much. But if you can imagine, when this bait was designed in 1915, there was no blueprint. One of the things that honestly amazes me looking at this bait is that in 104 years, crankbait design has actually changed very little. Yes, there's some subtle tweaks, but overall, if you think about a bait that is 105 years old, <laughs> this thing could catch a bass today. Of course, this is not the most famous offering from Creek Chub, and it would soon be outshined thanks to an angler by the name of George Washington Perry and a certain 22 pound, four ounce bass. Here is that bait, but we'll save that one for another episode. So welcome to Retro Bassin. Today I'm gonna to crack open my UMCO 3500 crankbait tackle box, and we're gonna take a little dive into crankbait history. By the way, if this is your first time here at Retro Bassin, and you like to fish it old school, I'm talking about classic rods, reels, allures, and equipment from the golden era of bass fishing. Consider subscribing and hit that bell icon. Otherwise, you won't know when we post a new video like this one. So I have to admit, uh, this is an episode that I have had in the works for quite some time. Uh, it's an episode that honestly, I'm pretty excited about, but I have dreaded starting this. The reason being, it is a daunting task to try to summarize, even briefly, the history of crankbaits. I know that there's gonna be some major, major misses in my timeline. And for that reason, it's been a struggle, honestly. Um, I have started this video several times and you know, I realize a, a lure or a bait that I left off and I kind of go back to the drawing board. So this is my history of crankbaits. This is probably not the definitive history of crankbaits. Uh, there's definitely gonna be some major things that, that we left off. The challenge with it is if you think about it, the first crankbait, the Creek Chub Wiggler was developed in 1915. Here we are over 100 years later. Um, even if that's a crankbait a year, there's still gonna be plenty that we miss. But that is what the Retro Bass and comment section is for, so please check out the video, but definitely drop a comment down below and let me know some other crankbaits that you think should be uh, included in the crankbait history canon. All right, here we go. A few short years after the Creek Chub Wiggler was patented, angler Laurie Rappler was busy making his own contribution to crankbait history on Finland's Lake Piani as he developed this bait, the original Finnish minnow. Using nothing but a shoemaker's knife and some sandpaper, Laurie set about his work creating a cork-bodied lure 
that mimic the movements of bait fish that he saw in the lake. His original versions were decorated with the tinfoil from chocolate bars, while melted photographic negatives made up the lure's protective coating. Rapala completed his first successful lure in 1936, and the rest is history. So here is an older version of a Rapala minnow, probably pretty similar to the ones that Laurie carved back in 1936. One of the things about the original Rapalas is they definitely have a much more delicate feel to them. The cork bodies are even lighter than they were today. I feel like there's even less um, epoxy on the outside and they were very much a hand fashion bait. You can even see here the white belly. That's actually the groove they carved in the wood uh, in which to place all of the hardware. We're gonna fast forward to 1944 when Texan Ralph Wom whittled the first ever bomber crankbait. The design was improved upon by a bomber bait company founders, Ike Walker, John Parker, and C.S. Tuberville, but the original shape and design of the bomber is still very similar to that 1944 version. The bomber was one of the first deep diving crankbaits and would dive to a depth of about 16 feet and quote, wiggle like hell. At one point, the bomber factory in Gainesville, Texas was cranking out over a thousand bombers a day and had a back order of 400 dozen. Not surprising, this was a fish killer back in the day, but it's not Bomber's last contribution to crankbait history. Here's a look at a wooden Bomber that I've got. This is one of the few wooden versions of this bait that I have. It's got the same heart-shaped metal lip with a snap on it, but it's got that wild Bomber body. One of the crazy things about the bomber bait to me is that it is one of the few crankbaits that actually runs backwards. And what I mean by that is every other crankbait, if you notice, the eyes are toward the lip in the direction the bait goes. But the bomber, even the bait fish pattern ones, have the eyes in the rear of the bait. Pretty wild. 1967 saw another massive shift in the world of crankbaits when Fred C. Young carved his first ever Big O crankbait. Named after his brother and lure tester Otis, the Big O featured a large wooden body and circuit board style lip. Fred hand signed every original Big O himself and sold them in empty egg cartons like this one. In today's original Big O market, this would be an expensive carton of eggs. This is a great video of the 1972 Bassmaster Classic where Ray Scott is interviewing an angler who caught some nice fish on a pretty new bait he calls the Big O. It's clear by Ray's expression that he's never actually heard of the bait, and even the angler himself isn't sure who designed it. But my favorite part of the video is when Ray Scott asks the angler, what is the Big O? And he says it's basically like a crankbait, and it feels a whole lot like throwing a pork chop. Uh, Fred eventually sold his patent to Carl Richard Cotton Cordell, who mass produced the bait in molded plastic form. But the original Big O, if you can find one signed by Fred, whew, that's gotta be like one of the most sought after collectible baits. So sought after that I'm gonna need like 50 more thousand subscribers if I'm ever gonna afford one. Hitting the shelves in the late 1970s with the unique and virtually indestructible molded body to build design was the classic Model A from Bomber. The line went from the half ounce 2A on up to the three quarters ounce 8A. But to me, the juice has always been the classic 7A. To me, there's nothing cooler than throwing a classic 7A in a Fire Tiger, or as they called it in the 1972 Bass Pro Shops catalog, Chartreuse Crawfish. Check this thing out. Man, when you think of Bomber, I do like the original Bombers, but there is something that is right up my alley about a 7A. Oh. And the only thing that could make that bait cooler was when one of my childhood heroes, Larry Nixon, 
put his signature on the Excalibur version of the 7A. So long before the XD, there was this bait, the DD. Of course, I'm talking about the Bill Norman DD-22. This bait is still sold today, but it really was one of the first baits out there that had a depth designation on it, even though it actually doesn't dive to 22 feet, but forget that. This thing has been winning tournaments since 1987, and it's made from butyrate, so it has more of a, uh, a deeper thud that bass, especially deep bass, love. Even though it says DD-22, this thing basically dives in the 14 to 18 foot range, depending on what kind of line you're using. But, man, on deep lakes, whew, this thing's still money. And listen to that thud, by the way. It does have, oh, just a really nice, just low-pitched boom. <sighs> if I was a bass on a point, I'd hit that. Milton Poe began carving lures out of red cedar in the 1950s. But it wasn't until the 1990 Bassmaster Classic that Poe's baits really got on my radar. With the help of two baits, the RC1 and the RC3, Rick Klon beat the competition on the James River to clinch his fourth Bassmaster Classic title. What I love about the Poe's baits is a couple things. Um, just that bait fish profile they've got, that classic coffin style lip, and of course the Pac-Man eye, because why not? Like many of you guys, I was a total pose junkie back in the day, and I remember picking up a few of these different pose gift boxes. This one happens to be the Christmas box. We're gonna take a little sidebar in our deep dive of crankbait history to show you this. Oh man. So back in the day, Pose used to sell this four pack of baits in a special wood crate <laughs> signed by Rick Clun. Check it out. So they're encased in what looks like cedar shavings and it still smells cedary. So this crankbait kit looks like we've got a couple of RCs. I see RC3, RC1. I also see a Pose 300. And one heck of a sweet keychain. Pose eventually sold to Brown and he moved production from California to Mexico. And unfortunately, the quality of the baits really took a significant hit. The lips on the Brown and even the Yakima models, in my opinion, are just not trustworthy. I've had way too many of them crack, even with light use. If you are lucky enough to find some Pose online and you want to make sure that you get one of the original Pose, here's what you need to look for. Pose baits in the classic fish case. By the way, this is one of the greatest all-time lure packages that I've ever seen. Check this out. So there we go, we've got an RC3 to RC1. And of course it does say the 1990 classic winner. <sighs> I still like these things. In 1956, Tom Mann founded Mann's Bait Company in Eufaula, Alabama. In my opinion, Tom Mann is one of the most underrated lure designers of all time. Sure, he had some misses. <laughs> like the hard worm. But for every one of these, he also had some real home runs, like the man's jelly worm and the little George. While most crankbaits at the time bragged about how deep they would run, the man's one minus was just the opposite. It bragged about how shallow it could get. Designed with a miniature lip that would keep the bait one foot or less in the water column, this thing was awesome for running large grass flats. There's a great ad in 1991 featuring Paul Elias who says, while other baits are catching grass, I'm catching fish. Oh, check this thing out. So this is, and by the way, I love the original one minus, that big chunk with that little lip. Oh. Back on the Potomac River, where you did have just some massive, massive grass flats, 
This has to be one of the top three crankbaits that you can throw on that body of water. This is a bait that honestly, I don't fish with nearly enough these days, but I think I need to start getting a little bit shallower with my crankbait game. So over the years, there's been a number of creative and some just downright insane crankbait designs. First off, there's a number of baits that loosely fit into the category of crankbait. Now, while when you think of traditional crankbait, you think of something that's got a lip attached to a body, but there were a number of baits that had a lip integrated into the body. First, there were baits like this is a knockoff Lazy Ike. And again, definitely a crankbait, but it's got that bill molded almost as an extension of the body itself. Another one that comes to mind that I would definitely put in the crankbait category is this one from South Bend, the Bassarino. That, to me, is definitely a crankbait lip. And even though it's got spoon in the name, the Buck Perry spoon plug is definitely all crankbait. So the lip material of crankbaits has changed a lot over the years. Those early baits like the Creek Chub Wiggler had metal lips, and there were a number of baits that followed it that also had similar metal lips. Some of my favorites I will show you. The Storm Hottentot, classic metal lip. Ooh, a little known one from Hedden called the Crackleback. And of course, no discussion of metal lipped crankbaits would be complete without this one. The original mud bug from Fred Arbogast. Oh, and there's two more metal lip crankbaits that I've got. First one, this one from Zebco called The Secret. Look how big that lip is. And the Big Dig from Burke, which has a really weird flexible body. <laughs> Over the past 105 years, there have been some wild body designs for crankbaits. One of the craziest I could think of, where is it? Ah. from Bagley's. Look at that crazy body. This thing has um, uh, quite a unique roll to it, I'll say. Got that in a couple different pretty sweet colors. Ah, uh, there it is in a fire tiger. I think I've got a small fat cat around here as well, yeah. Look at that. That's like a pregnant tadpole. Speaking of weird crankbait bodies, here's one I picked up not too long ago. The Rabble Rouser. Look at that dude. I have not fished this one yet, but it has got just one of the wackiest designs I've seen in a crankbait. Some crankbaits even border on being a little gimmicky, and one of the ones I think of in this category comes from Rebel, came out in the 1980s called the Black Star. This thing looks like something out of Tron, to be honest with you. It has got just this black graphite hardware, a really weird futuristic design. And I don't know if y'all can appreciate this, but it has got a funky curved lip to it. I have been throwing this thing actually a pretty good bit as of late, trying to see what this crankbait can do. Um, other gimmicks? Well, <laughs> here's a gimmick from one of my uh, all-time heroes, Dr. Lauren Hill. This bad boy, deep diving bad boy, is called the Chow Hound. It's got this little blade on the bottom that actually is meant to emulate a bait fish that's trying to get away from this fish. And when the bigger fish sees this fish, 
chasing this fish, I guess he just tries to eat the whole thing. <laughs> Sweet bait. I'm also a sucker for novelty crankbaits, and there's been a few over the years. Perhaps the most well-known is this bad boy from Hedden, the Big Bud, or in this case, the Big Course. I've never actually caught a fish on the Big Bud, but truth be told, I have not fished it more than a few casts. It's a really weird, awkward bait. It runs super high in the water column. It's got this weird wobble to it. And of course, this spinner with no swivel. I probably need to put a little bit more time in because honestly, I would love to catch one on this bait. Another crazy one from Hedden that I have not yet fished with is this, the Hedden Hightail. <laughs> Check that thing out. That almost looks like it would run sort of like a man's one minus, but it also looks like a mini whale, so I don't know. <laughs> and tis the season, we can't forget about this bait from Cotton Cordell, the Prez. <laughs> I do think this would actually catch fish, to be honest with you. And of course, I'm not going to leave out the lipless crankbaits like the classic rattle trap. But as I think you'll see by looking at my lipless crankbait tackle box, I think that one's going to need its own show. Well, that about wraps up our deep dive into crankbait history. No doubt I left off some major crankbaits, so please drop a comment down below. Let me know what crankbaits you think should have been included in this video. Till next time, keep those crankbaits a diving and definitely fish it old school. Making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassing.